Chapter 15 and 16 are closely related, so I usually teach them together. These videos are going to follow the same format as chapter 15 videos, where I'm going to give a lot of example questions and not fully explain all the material. That's what I, why I want you to read the book, to get that background material. We're only covering the first three sections of chapter 16, which focus on heat transfer mechanisms. Here I'm showing two black squares. They are made of different materials. They've been sitting in this location for several hours, so they should have the same temperature. They've reached what we call thermal equilibrium, where energy will transfer back and forth until everything reaches the same temperature. An object that's been sitting in the same location for hours without any fluctuating temperature should be the same temperature as everything else. So let's just double check that they're the same temperature. In this video, I'm gonna use an infrared thermometer and you can read off the temperature. So 70.5 for the left one, 70.5 for the right, and just to show you that it actually works, when I measure my hand, it jumps to 78. Okay, so these objects do have the same temperature. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna place a piece of ice on each object. The ice came from the same freezer, I just barely pulled it out of the freezer before this, and it's about the same size of ice. It was made from the same uh, tray. So let's watch what happens when I place those on the two black objects. And you can see instantly that the object on the right has a much different reaction to the ice than the object on the left. There's clear puddle forming, so the ice is melting on the right much faster. You can actually see the ice cube getting a little bit smaller as that uh, ice is converted to liquid. And remember, the ice came from the same location, so it has the same temperature, it was the same size, there wasn't anything special about the ice on the right. These two objects, the two black objects, had the same temperature. We just checked that. But clearly, there's a huge difference in the reaction to the ice. And see the object on the left really doesn't have any water to show at all when I remove the, the ice. I will explain why the object on the right here was able to melt the ice so much more efficiently than the object on the left, but before I do that, I want to get to our example questions. I'll let you read through them and give you time to answer. The answer is conduction. Conduction requires physical contact. So conduction is the key to explaining the difference between the black, black square on the left and the black square on the right. Even if you didn't read through the book, you probably have some intuition, some basic intuition for the concept of conduction. So the next couple of questions are gonna test that. The answer is none of the above. None of these are good conductors. If I change the question a little bit, now I'm asking about good insulators. How would that affect your answer? The answer this time is all of the above. In fact, the reason that the previous question was none of the above is because good insulators are bad conductors. So if all of these are good insulators, then they were all bad conductors. To transfer energy through conduction, it requires physical contact. So in this case, I have a metal rod. One end is in physical contact with fire. And the other end is touching some ice. The cue here, if you remember, 
from video on chapter 15, this is heat. And the heat is being transferred through the rod. Notice the direction, it's important. It's going from the hot over to the cold. How fast or how efficient that heat is being transferred is the study of conduction. Conduction depends on several different variables. For our purposes, for physics 1010, we're not actually going to get too much into those individual variables. I can mention really quick that the length of the material is important. Something called the cross section is important. But what we're going to focus on is a principle known as conductivity. Before I do that, oh, I just wanted to mention how energy is actually transferred. If you look at the individual molecules in the rod, they're increasing. So the fire over here is increasing their temperature. Remember, the temperature is just a measure of kinetic energy, so that's causing them to shake and vibrate more. Well, if they're all connected through bonds, that energy is going to transfer through. It's like holding onto somebody's hand and shaking it around. You can't, they can't help but be affected by that. So that energy starts to spread out through all these molecules, through their bonds, and it works its way down the material to the other side. Turns out that the bigger the temperature difference, so ice versus fire, the faster or the more efficient that energy transfer becomes. So if you think of conduction as just the transfer of, ener of motion energy or kinetic energy through these bonds, then it starts to make sense why energy never goes from cold to hot or low temperature to high temperature. Because over here in the ice, the molecules have very little motion. And so there's no energy, there's no motion to transfer to other particles. It's like the before when I said like holding somebody's hand and shaking it around, well, this would be the opposite. It'd be like holding somebody's hand and then just not doing anything. That's never going to affect the other person directly as far as getting them uh, passing them energy. So that's why it's always got to go from high temperature to low temperature because that shaking is what's spreading. If you don't have the shaking, nothing's going to spread, so no energy is transferred. The inherent ability of a material to transfer energy through its molecules, or in other words, the rate at which it's able to transfer energy, how fast it can pump it through, that's defined in a quantity known as conductivity. Here's a list of some conductivity values for common materials. How this works is the higher the number, the faster energy is allowed to flow through that object. So we say it's a better conductor. So the higher the number, the better a conductor you have. Copper is one that most people are familiar with. Copper is really good, really efficient at sending energy. Copper also happens to be really good at sending electricity through it which is why we use it, one of the reasons why we use it in the wiring in our homes. That's technically something different. That's electrical conductivity. Here we're talking about thermal conductivity, but it turns out that they're pretty much related. Usually if one's good with the electrical side, it's also going to be good with the thermal side. You can see that silver is actually a better conductor than copper, so it actually would be better to use silver wiring of course, there's other reasons why that's not practical. Look how high diamond is. It's more than twice the conductivity of any of these two below. All right, when you start seeing low numbers down here, these are what we call poor conductors, but another way to say that is these are insulators. So insulators are simply really bad at transferring energy. You can see that for the human body, where we have fat, muscle, skin, those are all fairly bad conductors, or in other words, they're fairly good insulators. That's actually a good thing for us. We don't want to be giving up our internal energy that easily. It would be too difficult to regulate our body temperature if it was that way. There isn't a hard cutoff, at least none that I've ever worried about, between an insulator and a conductor. You just simply compare the conductivity values. The lower it goes, the worse of a conductor it is and the better of an insulator it is. By comparing the thermal conductivity of these two blocks, we can explain their relative ice melting abilities. The block on the left was made of aluminum, which is a fairly good conductor, 
or in other words, it had a high conductivity. Its value was around 200 watts per meter Kelvin. Now, this unit might not mean anything to you, and I don't really expect it to, but in comparison to the block on the left, you can see there's a huge difference. The block on the left was at 0 0.03. This is made of a kind of a hard styrofoam, which is a very poor conductor, or in other words, a very good insulator. The aluminum, because it has such a high conductivity, it's able to transfer energy much faster than the styrofoam on the left. So that means in the same amount of time, a lot of a a lot more energy went through the aluminum than the styrofoam. That energy actually went from the aluminum block into the ice. Remember, energy has to go from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. Think of it as those, that shaking effect. So the ice was absorbing energy from the aluminum block. Most of that energy went into a phase change. That's why the solid ice melted into liquid water. During that same amount of time, very little energy was transferred from the styrofoam into the ice because of the low conductivity here. The styrofoam was able to slow down that energy transfer to a crawl in comparison to what was happening with the aluminum. Remember that these blocks started at the same temperature. I showed that in my first video. But now, they certainly wouldn't be at the same temperature. A lot of the energy that the aluminum block had is now in, went into the ice. So the aluminum block is actually at a colder temperature now in comparison to the styrofoam. The other interesting thing is if you were, able, if you were to touch the edge of the aluminum, it would instantly feel colder than it was before you put the ice on it because all of that energy is flowing through the aluminum fairly easily. It's a really good conductor. Where the styrofoam, even if with the ice sitting on it for you know, 45 seconds, if you were to touch the edge here, it wouldn't feel really any colder than it was before you put the ice. Because remember, it's, it's just really good at slowing down energy transfer. So there's really no energy out here that was taken and put into the ice, where over here the aluminum is really bad at slowing down energy transfer, so the whole thing is going to cool down relatively quickly. I want to show this video clip to emphasize the conductivity of different materials. This is Dr. Ron Galley from Weber State University, and he was a master at demonstrating physics principles. The video, unfortunately, is a little low quality. It was made uh, over a decade ago, and so the, the comparative quality of video at the time wasn't up to today's standard. But I think it's still good enough to see, and it does a great job of emphasizing different conductivity values. Let's watch. And now I'd like to demonstrate the relative conductivity of different metals. Here I have an apparatus with a, with a copper rod here, a brass rod here, uh, this rod is uh, aluminum, nickel, and this one down here is an unknown alloy. And we're going to uh, heat this up from the center and let the heat conduct out to the ends of each of these rods and uh, measure uh, which one has the greatest conductivity. That'll be the one for the wax ring to melt off first. So I'll heat this from the center. trying to uh, heat up uh, the uh, center end of uh, the, the center of this so that the uh, inner part of each rod gets heated the same degree and uh, let the heat conduct out to the ends of each of those rods and we now see copper is the first to go so it has the greatest conductivity and then uh, aluminum, and then brass, and uh, nickel, and then the unknown alloy.
Okay, hopefully all this was enough to really emphasize the importance of understanding conductivity. Let's test and see how well this is coming across. Here I have a beautiful picture of a nice, sunny, warm day. I want to ask this question. Is a sunny daytime temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit generally considered warm or cold? Well, that's really a personal opinion, but most people would agree that 70 degrees is warm. Now a different question. Is a swimming pool at 70 degrees Fahrenheit generally considered warm or cold? Now it could be you have no idea what the temperature is when you go to a swimming pool, but generally people would say that a swimming pool at 70 degrees Fahrenheit is cold. Now if you think about that, it really doesn't make any sense. How can water at 70 degrees be cold, but yet air at 70 degrees be warm? They're the same temperature. You can't have one be warm and one be cold if they're at the same temperature. So can you explain this? Yeah, well, really, we're using the improper terms. Cold and warm aren't really the proper terms to describe what we're experiencing. The better way to explain this is with thermal conductivity. Water has a thermal conductivity of 0.58. Now, that's generally considered not great in comparison to, say, copper or aluminum. That would be a really low value. But if you compare it to air, Air is at 0 0.026. So water has a thermal conductivity that's more than 20 times greater than air. Really what that means is water is going to transfer energy at a rate more than 20 times faster than air. Water is also really good at storing energy without changing its own temperature. We've talked about this with specific heat capacity. So water is really good, a lot more efficient at taking your energy than air, and it's also really good at storing that energy without changing its own temperature. So when we're swimming in a large pool, we're technically heating up the water, but not by any appreciable amount that we can feel, but yet it's really good at taking our energy while we do that. So it's not actually colder, we just perceive it as being colder. This is actually a perception issue. You can't say that water at 70 degrees is colder than air at 70 degrees. Your mind is interpreting the rate of transfer, not the actual temperature. So we're getting confused with the fact that energy is simply leaving a, our body faster. Now, to be fair, the rate of transfer does also depend on the temperature difference between the two objects. So a higher temperature difference between the two objects will increase the rate of energy transfer, but that's not what's happening between air and water. They were both at 70 degrees. So between 70 degrees and our body temperature, there's no difference there, but our mind is interpreting it that way. So we're sort of telling ourselves that the water is colder because we're interpreting it that way, even though strictly speaking, it's not. So it's kind of fascinating and in some ways, it doesn't really matter. Um, it still feels cold, but uh, it's actually not. And it's just, it's an interesting thing to evaluate from if you understand thermal conductivity. Here's another interesting comparison to make. Ice at 1.7 is about three times better at transferring energy than water at 0.58. Okay, where ice is just frozen water. However, snow is actually 10 times worse, roughly, even more than 10 times worse at transferring energy. So its thermal conductivity is more than 10 times less. Snow is also made of frozen water. So why is it that snow is a much better insulator compared to ice? Well, if you look at snow, 
Here's a nice fluffy image of snow. It's actually that fluffiness that gives it its insulative properties. Fluffy snow like this carries a lot of air. Air is a great insulator, or we could say poor conductor. So the more air you can combine with the snow, the better overall insulative properties you'll get. Ice, on the other hand, doesn't trap a lot of air and its molecular structure just makes it a relatively good conductor in comparison to snow or water. If you look down at fur and feathers, they're also poor conductors or good insulators, and they serve the similar purpose. Really, they trap a lot of air inside them, so anytime you can trap air, you're gonna give yourself a better insulative property. This is also why wearing tight-fitting clothing is not as good for insulation as wearing loose-fitting clothing that's able to trap the air and keep that against you. Air is just going to be a better insulator than most materials. We could also compare muscle and fat. You can see that muscle is more than twice the conductivity of fat, which means it's better conductor. So it is true that fat is actually a better insulator than muscle is. Let's get back to our questions. Go ahead and start reading these and pick your answer. The answer in this case is B. A rug is a poor conductor, or in other words, it's a better insulator than the tile. This question is often missed. A popular answer is A, where it's the thought that the rug feels warmer because it actually is warmer than the tile. But that's typically not how it works, assuming that the tile and rug are in the same room and one of them isn't in direct light compared to the other. You know, they're under the same room condition, so they really should have the same temperature. But when we touch them, we think one's colder because it's simply transferring energy faster. So it, it's really our interpretation of the interaction, not the actual result of one having a different temperature. So this is the same concept as the swimming pool. They're both at 70 degrees. So technically, one can't be warmer if it has the same temperature. But one can be better at taking your energy, and that's the one we tend to think of as being colder. You know, it's unfortunate that we can't do this in person because I could do the same thing with the aluminum block and the styrofoam block. Before I put the ice on them, when I tested them and found that they were the same temperature, if you were to touch both of them, you would definitely say that the aluminum one was colder, not because it actually is, just because it feels colder because it's so much better at taking your energy. And when you compare the ice cubes, it, you can definitely see that effect. Here's another question for you to consider. Okay, the answer is B in this case, and A is a popular answer, but that's actually wrong. You'll never truly be able to stop heat flow. Even the best conductor in the world is gonna have some heat flow to it. It's just a matter of how slow you can make that transfer. So good insulators are really good at slowing it down, but you'll never truly stop it. Next question. So hopefully this one was quick. It's always flowing from hot to cold. Your hand is gonna be hot so it's going to give up its energy to the colder ice. I can see why it's tempting to say that it flows from the ice to your hand because it almost feels like we're drawing out the cold of the ice. You know, if you if you close your eyes and put your hand on ice, it, you can almost imagine that. All right, another question. Well, if air were a better conductor, that would mean it would take more energy in the same amount of time. That would make things 
considerably colder. So it's a good thing that air has high insulative properties. This is kind of a tricky one. So even if you picked an answer, I want you to go back and rethink it. Okay, let's go over this. I actually don't have the exact right answer for this because it really depends on a few different factors. So let's look at these conductivity values again. Wood has a conductivity of 0.2. Snow ranges from 0 0.05 up to 0 0.2. So snow could actually be a better insulator than wood. You know, at the high end, it's the same insulation properties as wood. So to answer this question, it really depends on what kind of snow we have. If we have the lighter, fluffier snow with more air in it with a lower conductivity value, then that's going to be better than a wooden house. But if it's hard-packed ice, then that would be worse. Another thing we're not considering here is that the rate of energy transfer also depends on the thickness of the material it's being transferred through. So if you have a thicker block of wood, it could end up slowing the overall rate down more than a very thin layer of snow, even if you have a lower conductivity value. So there's more at play here than we're seeing, and because we're not doing the mathematics of thermal conductivity, we won't see all of those aspects. So there's not an exact answer to this question without knowing more information. I can say, though, that a tenth is not the right answer. A tent is very thin, it's going to have a decent thermal conductivity, so it's really not going to stop energy transfer very well. It's just much too thin. Uh, a car is similar. The, the glass on the car, it's so thin that it's really not going to stop energy transfer as well. So the thicker you make the material, the more likely it is to slow down the rate of transfer, regardless of the conductivity value. So that's why this question isn't actually straightforward. It depends on several variables. For our class, I'm not expecting you to understand all these variables right now. I, I haven't explained them, and the book doesn't really explain them. This is why I've been showing you all these example problems. These are the types of questions that you can expect. Really, it's just a relative comparison of, of conductivity in, in a more basic form. The only reason why I mentioned the variables is to give you an idea that this is a deeper subject than we're giving it credit for. And if you want to know more, then we can talk outside of class, or you can look into taking more classes on this subject. We spent a while on conductivity. Let's go ahead and take a break here. In the next set of videos, we'll finish up the other two types of heat transfer mechanisms.